How y'all doing? Well, for this uh, for this video is a paleo news here. We're going to talk about mammals, and particularly um, we have three papers. Two of them are about a group called Xenarthrans, and the other one's about Smilodons and direwolves. And uh, well, okay, Xenarthrans, you may not be familiar with that one, but fortunately, I can explain it to you through Prince's Field Guide to Prehistoric Mammals by Donald Prothero. Xenarthra, which is a group that includes sloths, ant ears, and armadillos. Now, um, let me go over this. For more than a century, zoologists have recognized that the Xenarthra were unusual and primitive placental mammals and not closely related to any other group. They're in, they, are oh, sorry. they are peculiar in having many strange anatomical features seen in no other placental, but retained from early mammals. And they lack other features that all placental mammals have. They also have unusually slow and poorly regulated metabolisms and small brains, and females in are, um, have a uterus that is divided by a septum and have no cervix. For many years, these animals were placed in the order Indentata, which means toothless in Latin, although only the ant ears are completely toothless. Sloths and armadillos um, have simple peg like teeth made mostly of dentin, um, with little or, or no enamel. Re regrettably, the order Indentata um, once included pan and pangolins and aardvarks as well. Uh, mammals that are not closely related to Xenarthrans, thus, we no longer use indent um, indentates. Retaining only the group's formal name, Xenarthra, joint, uh, strange joints in Greek. Uh, these names refer to all um, additional bony ridges and joints. Uh, um, these animals have been you know, have between vertebrae and their backs, and, uh, and to a unique way, their hip bones are fused to their spines. So that gives you kind of a rough idea about that. So. We're going to talk about two papers in dealing with Xenarthrans, um, all of them roughly in South America because there's um, a lot of them came from there. The first one it deals is um, Mega Ignis um, Ingens, you know, giant paleoburrows attributed to extinct Cenozoic mammals from South America. These are caves that actually um, they're not. They don't show signs that they were naturally carved out. Um, through water or um, or lava flows, these are giant, you know, big size caves. I'm going to crawl through, um, or and they're going to explore two of them. There's actually several of them littered throughout um, the coastline, the eastern, I'm sorry, um, eastern coastlines of South America, Argentina, Brazil, and Par Paraguay. Um, let me go over the abstract here. In the last 10 years, more than 15,000 large burrows have been discovered in southern and southeastern Brazil, dug in rocks that include weathered granitic and basaltic rocks, sandstones, and other consolidated sediments. Their presence in geological units of Pleistocene um, age suggests that large extinct mammals produced these structures. The eternal walls exhibit scratches and grooves left by the animals that inhibit these structures. The burrows are straight or slightly si um, sinus tunnels that um, measure up to tens of meters in length. One small type measures one and a half meters in diameter. And the larger type can reach two meters in height, four meters in width. You know, they're elliptical in shape. Uh, suggesting that these structures have been produced by at least two kinds of organisms. The contribution proposes a classification of these ichnofossils under the um, gen generic designation Mega Ignis Ingens Nove. Consisting of two Ichno species identified so far, um, Mega Ichnus Major, Mega Ichnus Minor. Um, although the exact identity of these producers of burrows is yet unknown, the dimensions and morphology point to giant to ground sloths or giant armadillos. So here this paper talks. Oh, um, the name of the paper. Oh, sorry about this. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, I already said that. I already said this. This is by uh, Renato Pereira Lopez, and let's like. Let's see, the, the journal is, well, Ichnos, uh, you know, volume zero, 2016. So it came out last year. So these are caves that, you know, um, they see signs of scratches. They see some um, hair prints. They even have um, joint um, burrows into, you know, um, like one tunnel is going right into the other. And these are going through rocks that some of them go through, um, um, uh, Cretaceous, I think, so Mesozoic times. There's also that some of these rocks date back to the Cambrian, but despite all that, they show signs that you know that they're dug out by mammals and most likely are the giant armadillos or sloths. 
it's interesting looking at the pictures um and some of the um one of the pictures there shows a nice little um l shape here so obviously not a natural flow and not to mention you know, like i said it doesn't have to show it doesn't show signs of the lava tunnels or um or water flows or anything no it doesn't show the cracks and fissures associated with that but they do show impressions that it looks like um the hair um rubbed on the sediments that could have been when they were scratching themselves because elephants can do that to get rid on trees to get rid of parasites or to stop an itch and they do see claw marks now the let's see in the discussion part it you know talks about you know just you know what could cause this and why they're not the other types of caves and let's see they suggested it's either um your type of armadillo for the smaller you know one of the primitive armadillos that's a little bit larger than our current ones and it also talks you know and the larger ones could have been uh two of the larger species of ground sloth not necessarily megatherian because um it's um not you know or others because the structures of their um arms are not suited for that but the couple of examples they give um glossotherium lestrodon uh, lestodon could have been you know possible um species inhabited that or maybe a close relative they don't find bones in in these caves at all so um we don't have any direct evidence doing that and also, another interesting aspect of these caves is that it's not necessarily done by one that stayed in there a while one could have gone in and either left or died as it left to grab food and then another one found it later on and um it started and they started digging further in and they could tell because the tunnel that's being built with that is slightly different size than the one before. So that I just find fascinating. And one of the things that he figured that they would do this, you know, building up these large burrows, because um, Xenarthrans aren't very good in um, maintaining um, body temperatures. Not suited for, or I should say, put it, they're not very suited for colder environments. And one of the things about building up a tunnel like that is that the temperature stays, you know, relatively constant in comparison to the outside world. So yeah, it's it makes sense that they'll do this. It's just hard to figure out directly which one it is because you know, but they can narrow it down to a couple cultures. But very fascinating read. Okay, so going to the next one. This one is a bit more um, technical. Um, from let's see, uh, journal um, Elsevier.com. You know, this is a journal. You know, online journal does this. Um, gone. Well, that's just a website. They got this one for Gondwana Research, I believe, is a journal. Isotopic insights on paleo diet and extinct Pleistocene megafaunal um, Xenothrans from Argentina by um, Herve Brocheron et al. Let me go ahead and read the abstract here. The diet of extinct giant Xenothrans is a debated topic, especially for ground sloths, for which herbivory insect, insectivory, ah, sorry, insectivory and carnivory through scavenging or active hunting have been suggested. In this study, um, stable carbon isotopes topic compositions of collagen and carbonate fraction um, of well-preserved fossil bones were used as a tracer to um, a tracer to trophic level greater than 200 modern mammal uh, more than 200 modern mammal bones of species with a variety of diets were used as a reference data set the good preservation of the carbonate isotopic composition was checked using different diet genetic indicators and by using fossil, carniv um, car fossil carnivorous and herbivorous taxa from the same sites to test, ta uh, test taxa. The result on modern mammals indicated a clear distinction in the difference between the carbon isotopic composition of carbonate and collagen between um, faunivores, which is including your carnivores, insectivores, piscivores, and omnivores. In other words, animals that, you know, that can take in meat in their diet, and they found that there's a difference between that and herbivores. Used in this framework, the results of these fossil megafunnels and arthrons indicate an herbivorous diet of both glyptodontids and, um, and are also consistent with the herbivorous diet of giant ground sloths, including megatherian. The hypothesis of megatherian could be a cryptic meat eater or the insectivore is not supported by results obtained in the present study. Okay, you may have heard about the giant, famous giant ground sloth. And you figure, okay, well, sloths exist today, the tree hanging, the slow tree um, hanging ones, and of course they're herbivorous. And a small one could be herbivorous too, most likely, because just look at the teeth. The problem with xenarthrans, they don't have very distinctive teeth to tell whether it is 
You know, obviously they're not the ones you find in strict carnivores, but you can't rule any meat out of their diets um, because of that. They're blunt enough to take in plants. So this is a study that attempts to try to figure out, um, based on the differences in the carbonate, in between what's in the um, bones and in the collagen of, per of, of perfectly preserved bones. This is going to be hard to do. I mean, they go into the details of this about what they do and the materials, um, the methods that they use in order to repair it and how they run it through and tell them about the results. They even talk about the statistics to show how good this is. Now, I, well, in the Paleo Journal Club meeting, one of the graduates mentioned that um, a couple of the groups that had low sample size. This is to be expected. Again, it's something you probably need to keep in mind when you read such things is that it doesn't rule <clears throat> their research out, but it does leave room to try this again and see if you get different results later on. The difficulty is just trying to collect more fossil bones, particularly ones good enough to where you could destroy, because this does require destroying the bone material in the process just to get the, um, the testing that they need done. The interesting results, um, let's see, um, many of, you know, is that things like the um, glyptodons, which are giant um, relatives of the armadillo, and sloths were definitely herbivorous. You know, um, you know, they you know, showed, you know, based on the differences between that, the, uh, the way it's right now is um, delta carbon-13 carb-col, um, um, which is a um, carbon and um, carbonate and uh, collagen. They're measuring a difference in the isotopes in there. Now the paper does say that um, those that eat meat in their diets have a different um, carbonate to collagen um, reading than say those are strict herbivorous. They don't know the, process, the metabolic process why that is, but they just know that it is and they could use that to test this out. It worked, in other words, this paper says that it worked before in another test or trying again with this one to see, you know, to sort of uh, answered a question about particularly megatherine and it shows that um, at least this study shows that things like um, um, megatherian were definitely strict herbivores because there have been research saying that they could be insectivores or they're accidental carnivores they, you know, they eat around but they just get some meat in the process of that but this study shows that that's not the case so this one, uh, oh, not overly too technical, but if you're new to this, this may be a bit much, but I always suggest to read what you can. So there you go with that. So that's the Zenarthrins. Let's turn around to a different group of mammals now, something a bit more interesting. Let's see, through uh, Nature, Ecology and Evolution, pub you know, published in 2017 in April. So it just came out r real recently. Caitlin Brown et al. publishes Skeletal Trauma Reflects Hunting Behavior in Extinct Sabertooth Cats and Dire Wolves. Okay, you know, Sabertooth, you know, cats and dire wolves. They go out and hunt. They may, you know, their bodies is just two different types of hunting. And whenever they do, especially when attacking larger prey, their bodies can take a toll. Stresses on their bodies, around their neck, their back, their claws, their ankles, and all that. The question is where? Let's go ahead with the abstract here. Well, let me get close up. Skeletal injury frequency and distribution are likely to reflect hunting behavior in predatory vertebrates and might therefore differ between species with distinct hunting modes. Two Pleistocene predators from the Rancho La Brea asphalt seeps, um, the saber-toothed cat, Smilodon um, fatalis, and direwolf, Canis deris, represent ambush and pursuit predators, respectively. On the basis of the collection of over 1,900 pathological elements, the frequency of traumatic injury in, across skeletal elements in these two species was calculated. Here we show the frequency of trauma in the saber-toothed cat exceeds that of the dire wolf, 4.3% compared to 2.8. Implying that the killing behavior of Smilodon um, entailed greater risk of injury. The distribution of traumatic injuries are also differ between the um, two species. Smilodon, an ambush predator, uh, was injured more often than expected across the lumbar vertebrae and shoulders, whereas you know, Canis um, deris, a pursuit predator, had higher and higher than expected levels of injury in the limbs and cervical um, vertebrae. 
Spatial analysis was used to quantify differences in the distribution of putative hunting injuries. Analysis of injury locations to discriminate true hotspots from injury dense areas and facilitate interpretations of predatory behavior. Demonstrating the use of spatial analysis in the study of vertebrate behavior in evolution. These results suggest that the differences in trauma distribu distribution reflect distinct hazards of each species' hunting modes. This would make sense. Now, this paper starts off showing with a, a my prediction, you know, about um, where there most likely to be injuries in these two animals, and there was a couple surprises here and there. Uh, the slideshow shows um, um, one picture with the four bones. One of them, let's see, um, pathological direwolf atlas, which is the first vertebrae that you know connects to the skull itself it shows one healthy one and but then one distorted one it also shows vertebrae below that one again check the slideshow of damages in the spine that were caused during the hunting and let's see um minimum number of individuals yeah on the basis of most common actual element we estimated a minimum of 342 um smilodons and 371 um uh, were preserved in as a pit. So this was found that these samples were found in one pit in La Brea, um, famous La Brea um, tar pits. Kind of redundant name, I know, but it's actually asphalt. But a famous tar pits in California that trapped all these animals. And they yeah, have one pit. They had all these specimens, and they used that to um, do their study. Let's see. Oh, uh, going up. Evidence of wounds were less frequent as both species. Um, so yeah, they do show in figure two, observe and expected counts of pathological elements in anatomical regions, a smilodon and, can and canis. Let's see, in the smilodon, um, let's see, and they show a graph of, you know, a sort of bar graph, and a higher, the observed count of um, injuries in each part, starting from the skull um, to the lumbars, and also the shoulders, the pelvis, the femur, the legs, and all that. And it looks like smilodon took a lot and um, a T13, let's see, cervical, um, uh, traumatic chronicle, oh, thoracic, sorry. Uh, thoracic vertebrae 13 took a lot of stress. Um, the lumbar vertebrates took, um, um, took a lot of stress as well. That's your lower back. Um, let's see, the sacrum, the pelvis, um, the scapula, that's your shoulder blade, humerus, upper arm bone. Um, those took a lot of stresses too. So a lot of upper body and lower back took a lot of, you know, were a lot of stresses that occurred in Smilodon. In the dire wolf, Canis dirus, um, it looks very well low, a little bit on the skull and cervix, you know, cervix, you know, just neck vertebrae. But it also shows a majority of it in the femur and tibula. Um, these are your leg bones. Uh, sacrum, that's your hips. And, and also in the humerus and radius, which are arm bones, you know, in the ulna. So they seem to take it right in the, the extremities of the limbs as well, not so much in the back itself. And they showed this wonderful um, graph. Let's see. Figure 3, distribution of traumatic and chronic patholo pathology centroids across Smilodon and Gancanus skeletal base maps. And it shows the, um, um, the skeletons of the two, and along with them, um, what looks like pixelated outlines of these of these animals and it shows that the hot spots in the smilodon were of the you know uh, let's see mostly the lower back um and uh, the thoracic and the lower thoracic ones and the lumbar ones and a little bit of uh, red spot near the neck at the upper thoracic well it looks like the majority of the dire wolves were in the limbs and some in the neck it's fascinating how um, where they show all the stresses and all that. And this also gives way to, you know, this would make sense since even with modern wolves, you see them chasing their tr prey, they use their legs a lot, so it puts a lot of stress in there as well as um, jumping onto their prey. So you can see a lot of stresses there. And Smilodon, being an ambush predator, could go, you know, will have to sneak up. And if it's attacking a heavy one, it's trying to grab hold of it, and a lot of the stresses of the torquing and twisting as it's trying to make a kill would be in those areas I just described. So out of all the three, that's probably the most fascinating for you, but I do this, I um, started doing this because I figure if you, you know, 
you know that way you can inspire you to read the journals themselves i'll post them down below go to those websites and get the pdfs read it for yourself you know, best you can because uh, this is where the science is you know publishes at so there you go that's a lot to talk about mammals very fascinating study on um, various groups and things you probably never thought about habitats and paleo diets and how we describe diets and arthrons and you know the stresses of the skeletons of this you know the two of the famous predators of the cenozoic era thank you all for watching and you have a nice day